Pangana Ian Anderson, Palawa Chawana, Pamarana, Chawalawai, Plamamarana, University of Melbourne. Katuma Zamine, Wurundjeri, Tiana. Kanamine, Nena, Nika, Nenena. Good evening. My name is Ian Anderson. I'm the Pro Professor for Indigenous Higher Education and the Pro Vice Chancellor Engagement here at the University of Melbourne. It is a protocol of Aboriginal peoples of this country to pay respect to the traditional custodians of country. And I do this on behalf, in particular, of my mother's people and all those as, uh, assembled here. We honour the custodians of this place, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We honour their ancestors and their Narangata, or their clan elders. I also pay my respect to the Aboriginal peoples of the country of Nam, the, the place of Port Phillip Bay. The Boon who share the country of Birung, the Yarra River. The Wadha Wurrung from beyond the Werribee River. The Jaja Wurrung and the Changurung peoples of central Victoria. And I acknowledge our elders and our community. And tonight I particularly want to honour the memory of two great Narangata of the Wurundjeri people, William Barak and Simon Wonga. As Wurundjeri elders, um, they made a particularly uh, insightful contribution to call and peoples in the in the troubled times of the uh, 19th century. We at the University of Melbourne honour the name of Barak in the naming of Mura Barak at this university as in the spirit of William Barak. He was an inspirational leader. He encountered great sadness in his life. He was a small boy in 1835 when Batman made his infamous land deal. He captured the art, uh, through his art, many representations of Aboriginal ceremony and was a particular advocate of remembering and honouring uh, their cultural traditions. However, he and Simon Wonga understood the, uh, the economic reality of the Kulin, who were in the 1850s dying destitute in the streets of Melbourne, without an economy and without opportunity. 150 years ago, he led the, re the remaining Wurundjeri, Changawurrung and Bunurrung people to settle down, actually deliberately to settle down and establish a farming community and a mission they called Corrindirk. And it was a successful farming community. He had a deep respect for his cultural traditions, but a vision of a possible economic future uh, for his people. The country of Nam still gives us in generosity and the spirit of uh, reciprocity, and it's in that generosity that we're here tonight to uh, hear from and think about some really important policy challenges uh, for us in Indigenous Australia. And it's in the spirit of reciprocity that I want to finish by uh, referring to uh, some of my own family's tradition. In the coastal waters of Larapana, or Point Edistone, where my mum's family come from, Aboriginal women still harvest uh, and craft shell necklaces. The most precious of these is the marina shell. It's a sublime expression of form and beauty. So significant was this tiny shell that it was remembered in the name of country and clans, and all along the coast you'll find clan names with marina, meaning in the waters of, and the waters of the shell. The marina shell was shared as a gift across the island of Trawana, or Tasmania, in the same spirit of exchange and reciprocity that we want to celebrate and honour tonight. And in the ancient and sacred exchange is perhaps best expressed in the language of Palawakani, which is the Creole language of the Bass Strait Islands. And it's in this I want to finish my acknowledgement of country. Mlethina Nika Mlethina Mana, Tapulchi Larapana, Tapulchi Paladini, Tapulchi Kanini, Tapulchi Taricha. Mlethina Nika, Waranta Pekana, Waranta Palawa, Mlethina Nika. I want to now introduce or we'll hand over to um, uh, Mr. Alan Tudge, who the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Prime Minister, to actually formally introduce uh, tonight's proceedings. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Ian. If I could at the outset acknowledge the, the traditional owners and pay my respects to the elders past and present and acknowledge Professor Marcia Langton up the front and other special guests here. Um, 
Paul Briggs from the Shepparton community and I know other deans of the faculties here. My job really is just to introduce the, the main speaker today, which is Andrew Forrest. And I do so by giving a bit of context to why he is here. And I reflect back at the start of this year. And as you probably know, in the opening week of the federal parliament, it is now a tradition that the Prime Minister will deliver a Closing the Gap report, where he or she will report progress on how we are going against six Closing the Gap indicators. And it's typically the case, since Kevin Rudd initiated this, there's good and bad news. And in this year's Closing the Gap indicators, there was some reasonable news on the early childhood indicators, where we're getting close to closing the gap all together on those. There was some neutral news in relation to life expectancy and some of the school education targets. But the most disappointing part of the report was in one of the indicators where we're not neutral, we're not improving, but in fact we've been going backwards over the last five or six years, and it's in the indicator which I think is actually the single most important one, and that is on employment. And indeed now the gap has got to be about 30 percentage points for Aboriginal Australians. And when you project out to the future and you see that half the population is below the age of 21, then you see that the projections aren't great either unless we fundamentally change the current trajectory. So given that and given the importance on employment, the government, the Prime Minister, sought the advice of somebody who has done in Indigenous employment well. And not just done it well in terms of employing Indigenous people by the thousands, but also having engaged with Indigenous companies, engaged with Indigenous people, negotiated with Indigenous traditional owners in relation to access to their land, and has started a, a not-for-profit which has been targeted at Indigenous employment, Generation One. And what's more, not only has done all of that, but as someone who, in almost every step of his life, has bucked the system and has done what many people have said the, was the impossible. And so Andrew Forrest, who is the guest tonight, I think fits the bill perfectly to provide advice to the government on Indigenous employment, having those attributes behind him. And I've had the pleasure of working with him over the last six or eight months, along with Marcia Langton, who's been engaged as a special advisor to Andrew, to produce what is now a, a very comprehensive report, which, as Andrew will explain, and as you may know, goes from early childhood all the way through to training and employment. We've been consulting on this report, having received it over the last um, couple of months, to get people's reactions, and then we're going to be making decisions in the months ahead, and then working with Indigenous communities about how some of these recommendations might be implemented. But it's been um, a joy to work with Andrew along the way. It's, it's always interesting working with Andrew. It's never dull, and, um, but I think he's got some very interesting insights in his report, um, which we are taking very seriously. And I invite you, Andrew, now to, to come up and and give us an overview of what's in your report, and then I know that uh, uh, Professor Rufus Black is going to be um, moderating a discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I too very gratefully pay my respects to the traditional owners past and present, um, uh, and um, particularly those leaders present, and uh, of course I nominate Marcia Langton here, um, who, uh, with this university, I'm very grateful to because Marcia wasn't appointed with me. I, once appointed, I reached out to Marcia um, to come and give me a hand with this review, to really give me um, her wonderful insights. Um, her, her experience is very different to my own. We'd create that kaleidoscope of experience, which perhaps could bring common sense to the um, freight train of expenditure which this country wastes on um, propping up a disparity. And I don't see the Indigenous disparity for a great deal more than what it is. It's, it's a vulnerability. It's a disparity of vulnerability which is suffered by all people who are 
vulnerable but yet indigenous people carry another burden. They carry an additional burden of a soft bigotry of low expectations. And this is totally unwarranted. When I um, look at my own childhood, I see that the fact that I was mentored, I was raised by people who to this day I think of in the most highest esteem of all the elders in my life, black or white. To this day, I know that Indigenous women with a degree perform even higher in the workforce as success than their non-Indigenous sisters. So we know that this is an in, the disparity is an invented uh, problem. It's invented by man, it can be stopped and, and rid of our country by man. And I know that this country must do this. This country cannot live where if you're an Indigenous woman, you're 30 plus times more likely to be hospitalised for assault due to drugs and alcohol related offences than you are if you're not Indigenous. Or that rises to over 80 times in the Northern Territory. That's not Australia. It's not an Australia I'm proud of. My best friends, my Indigenous friends when I was a kid, they were smarter than me. They, were, they sang better, they acted better. They were certainly better at sport. But they're no longer here. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? When we're dealing with a race of people who we joined in their fair country, who are every bit the equal to us, why is that? And I know why it is. It comes down to that burden of low expectations. It comes down to how that translates into, if you were just for a moment a child of parents who, when you woke up, said, you know, you're not looking so great today. You're not gonna, you're not gonna go so well at school, you know, and I have to give you a bit more pocket money and a bit of a hand up. Hey, look, darling, what about you don't go to school? You just might embarrass us. If you've heard that a few times in your childhood, let me assure you that you wouldn't be sitting here today. So, when I was approached by the Prime Minister to remove the impediments to employment, to me it was an easy decision. I would come up with solutions and ideas which would allow Indigenous people just to be themselves, to flourish, and allow no possibility of that when that bigotry is repeated and repeated, such as forgiving poor school attendance or allowing parents to not bother to send their kids to school. Or any of the other things which, which mark the Indigenous person on a road to disparity and in many cases eventually failure and early death, which is just a statistic, there's nothing dramatic in what I'm saying. Then I found that challenge easy and it's, of course it has resulted in policies which are different, which will um, completely define who we are as Australia. Are we Australians who are prepared to be big-hearted people, continue to throw welfare at people who perhaps aren't so great at making phenomenally good short-term decisions as to have got themselves into needing other people's handouts to be able to very survive, should we just tick our conscience box and say, yes, have cash. I've listened to the human rights lobby. I've learnt from welfare lobbyists and ACOS and others that we should, the only thing wrong with welfare is that we don't throw enough of it around. Or should we perhaps not give up on our fellow Australians? Should we perhaps not go that extra mile for them? Should we perhaps not project ourselves a little further out and say, what is putting you in this despair? What habits, black or white, are keeping you down? And yes, there's despair. Of course, all the elements of disparity and what's behind that will very often, those hospitalizations and those disparities are caused by drugs and alcohol and kept down by an avarice and an addiction to gambling. And I've just come back from Columbia. I've got all these t-shirts I'm prepared to hand out here. Let's get rid of gambling. You, know, you wouldn't know it's a big problem here in Melbourne, but it's a huge problem. It's highly addictive. And if you've got cash, then what goes on drugs? Okay, we're going to spend on alcohol if you're a vulnerable Australian, because when that cash rolls in the door and you're feeling like a hit, because you didn't feel so great what you did last night, 
and you're from a race of people who feel shame seriously, then you may well go down to the publican and pick up that carton of grog, which is going to repeat the offence again. And you do that a few more times and you'll gamble away those sober hours or worse. And that leads to a very elevated rate of suicide in our Indigenous communities. So I've said, OK, let's, let's produce a card which takes advantage of a technology which is just broken. It's not available in South Africa where they use a cashless debit card system and save themselves hundreds of millions of dollars just in administration and many more times they won't disclose on fraud. But it allows us to switch off access to alcohol, switch off access to gambling instruments and gift cards and certainly switches off access to drugs. Now, I've had people say to me, you know, I'll get around this healthy welfare card. I'll go and buy my $500 of groceries, which is about eight times more than the national average, and I will sell that for $200 and I'll go and buy my crystal meth and you, Twiggy, can go to Blazers. And I say to people like that, and I've run into them, Beauty, you go do that. I know for sure if you had $500 cash, mate, you'd buy $500 worth of crystal meth and what you didn't use your $200, you'd probably sell to someone else. And they say, hey, you've just made me pay a fine. I said, no, I haven't. That's, that's the market. So I've looked for market-based solutions in everything. When I talk of 4% employment, well above our national average, 4% employment for anyone who seeks to be a model employer. Let's just take state and commonwealth governments. Let's take the private sector. We all want to be model employers. Well, righto, let's step up. Let's employ at least 4% of our Indigenous fellow Australians. What's holding that back? Well, there's attitudes. There's that soft bigotry of low expectations I've touched on. But there's also a lack of relevant training in our haste to pour billions of dollars and to tick our conscience box. We haven't gone the extra step, that harder step, to give relevant training. It breaks my heart that Brendan O'Connor, who was the employment minister for the Labor government under Rudd, couldn't bring himself to put the billions and billions of dollars I told him he was going to barbecue if he didn't attach 26 weeks as a minimum criteria to the major outcome. Now, everyone in this room, I may assure you you're only here because you have been successful. And if you constantly failed, you wouldn't be here. Welcome to the world of employment service providers. You can fail and still be paid happily. You are more interested in process than you are in results. Five years later, Marcia and I looked down our cynics when we launched the Australian Employment Covenant, we said we're going to get guarantees for 50,000 jobs for Indigenous people. And I remember the critics, and I'm sure you do too, Professor, where they said, you're setting up the country to fail, Indigenous people, this, that, the other thing, it'll never work. Well, we're currently sitting at about 63,000. And we've filled 20,000 jobs. It's the biggest migration from long-term welfare to work that this country's seen. And it's all because we don't take any reward until we're at 26 weeks. Now, it, it beggars belief, and everyone in this room, if, you, if I could give you a call to arms, it would be to just remember two words. Eric Abetz. <laughs> Eric Abetz is about to repeat this. With another $5 billion, he's going to barbecue you again because the employment services lobby is so strong and so quiet. If they put their head up above the public parapet, it would probably be shot off. But they do this very quietly and they lobby very hard. And Luke Hartzinger, the Assistant Minister, has lobbied Eric. And they're about to go out with another cool five billion of your money, which won't be attached in the majority to a 26-week outcome. And I'm now saying to you, University of Melbourne, I expect you to employ 4% Indigenous people. That's the minimum you can do. And you should say rightfully, we're not a charity. Where are these people who have been trained to what we need? 
and you should go to the employment service providers and they'll say, oh, we're going to get paid regardless. It's your problem. I'm saying this is a policy which we should speak up against and we should arrest. And I'm told, look, it's, it's, it's a set jelly, Andrew, but those contracts are not issued. And where we need to be model providers and employ at least 4% of our first Australian brothers and sisters, we need to know that the government's working with us, not against us. We need to know it's not repeating the mistakes of the previous mistakes. This is just part of the policies which we've spoken of. There's others which uh, seem to be inflammatory. I'm afraid they're just simple common sense. If you are a parent, above your welfare, above your housing money, you get family benefits allowance to help you send your kids to school, yet you don't do it. A human rights activist will say, well, hang on, you should still get that money. It's above everything. It's there to help you send your kids to school. If you can't be bothered to carry out that simple, social, but absolutely irreplaceable duty that you as a parent can only do, then I believe we should start switching off that family benefits allowance until you decide to send your kids to school. And this is something which white Australia has had quite a lot to say. And they've said, we think that's too tough. I say, get out to Indigenous Australia be one of those poor mothers who live in a house with six kids who are going to school and try living next to the house with eight kids or three kids who are not going to school and the peer group pressure from that three or that eight on your six kids, not to mention the behaviour of that house, is massive. So they're dragging your kids down as well. Speak to those people and say, oh, no, it's punitive. It's not punitive, it's common sense. And if there's one corollary all through the Creating Parity Review is that it's just common sense. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you for that uh, introduction to, to your review, some of the background of it. One of the things that, as everybody uh, who's read it has kind of reflected on is You've clearly brought a lot of the extraordinary experience you've had uh, with the Indigenous community from your upbringing in the Pilbara through to uh, all of the work that you've, uh, that you've done with Fortescue Medals. Uh, what have been the big kind of insights from that lifetime of engagement that you would say, if you really understand this review, then here are some things you really need to know um, that you've learnt on that, on that journey? Um simply that uh that i've been told that i've got a sweet so simply that um that uh indigenous people have all the same aspirations all the same if not more talents they have a fantastic culture and those two do not conflict those two do not conflict and i can't just define it to my pilbara experience as a child where i was mentored and taught by indigenous elders who i love dearly I have to relate it to my experiences going to Japan or China or Israel and see their culture as strong as ever throughout their generations. And know that their advancement in the modern world and their ability to enjoy all the fruits of the modern world has not in any way impacted. In fact, it's strengthened their ability to preserve and celebrate their culture. Very good. One of the things that right through your report, it's more than a prescription. It's really calling for a big set of shifts in how we approach this problem generally. I wonder if you could share a little of what the big shifts are, the overall shifts that you said, this is going to work well. Here are the big policy shifts, the shifts in emphasis that we're going to need to make. Okay, I think um, I've touched on a couple, but job specific training. Uh, let's, just, let's just be really clear, um, if, if you, if you can converse well and you can drive a car, even if you can't write, you are an absolutely employable person with some really specific training. So we should stop wishing um, people to be where we'd like them to be when we start training. We should go to where they are. So government policy right now will never have an Indigenous or non-Indigenous company walk in the door of someone at eight o'clock in the morning 
when they've had a conversation Thursday night in the pub previously where someone like me has been had up, hey, brother, give me a job. I want a job. I said, no, 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 mate, you get some training. Oh, I'll get the training. Give me a job. So, righto, righto, um, eight o'clock training starts. You know, you know the VTEC, you know where it is? Yeah, mate, I'll be there. I said, well, I don't believe you. I'll be there. Okay, well, when you're not there, tell me where you live and I can, tell me I can go into your home. Drag your sorry backside out of bed. So let's brush your teeth and let's get to training. No worries. So on Monday when you do that, and they look up at you and they are amazed you're there. And you just say, let's go. Come on. Now, that works. They don't see that as invasion of privacy. They see that as you are believing in them simply because you are believing in them. And you've gone the extra mile. You've walked into their home. Now, there's no government official or anyone on the bureaucratic payroll who could ever do that because the risk, the liability goes through the roof. You'd be dismissed at once. But the private sector and the indigenous sector, they'll do that all the time. And I've done it. I've done it dozens and dozens of times. So we've got to actually meet people where they are and bring in policies which encourage indigenous companies to train and employ indigenous people. Now, the way to do that, I think, is through creating tax effectiveness before the treasurer gets really hot and sweaty about this. So you're not earning a bean from these people. In fact, they, they are very highly represented in the incarceration system. And even in Western Australia, there's no change out of a million dollars from a crime to a legal system to an incarceration to counselling. It's more than a million dollars. So this is bleeding the system. Let's change the system to allow Indigenous companies, which employ a majority of Indigenous people, most of which are from the very difficult to train, let alone employ, categories. And let's give them tax breaks because they'll be able to fix a problem which government never can. No matter how many billions you choose to fry on it, you will not do it. Change the system, let the market do it. In your um, address, you touched on the healthy welfare card, definitely one of the more controversial aspects of the, uh, of the package. Perhaps uh, for all of us, you could just walk through the kind of logic of, why you, of how this will work and why it's so compelling. Okay, so we're, we're clear in the report that it's for vulnerable Australians. And we did, we did say wherever government chooses to bring this in, we do not want to ever see it for any reward pensions, old age pensions, you know, military pensions, etc. It's just for vulnerable Australians. So if government got out of hand and said it's bringing it in everywhere, um, let's at least have that out. Um, we argue it should be for vulnerable Australians. Um, and it is from a technology which has emerged that you can pick it to, to not bore you all with the technical jargon. It's called the SKU point. It's where um, the scanner identifies exactly what you're buying. And, um, and I've just come from a meeting with the head of FPOS. Um, the, the FPOS have assured me that they'll have the equipment complete, not for this, but they'll have it complete to be able to handle this by June next year. If government set the policy now, we'd be struggling to get it in for June next year. And I, I've said to government, well, just start with vulnerable Australians. Let's start with everyone under 18. Can any human rights activist please give me an argument why someone under 18 should have free access to alcohol and drugs? And I've had plenty try that argument on, and I've won that one. Um, um, could, you, could you argue with me, please, why if you're from a community in Cape York or the Pilbara or Kununurra or the Kimberleys or more recently the Eastern Deserts, and you've said, I want this card for my community, and here are all the elders, why stop them? And then... If you want to roll it out, then let's look at the statistics and they're very publicly available. The NAPLAN results, incarceration rates, being out of work for five years straight. Let's try it for them too. So I don't see a lot of argument around it. I don't think it's contentious. I think if, if you argue that it is, then you need to have a little walk on the wild side just in some of your suburbs in Melbourne um, and you'll work out why you don't like to walk there after dark. Some, some critics of it have said uh, that income management hasn't been uh, a particular success and that this is no more likely to succeed than some of the other income management schemes. How have you come back to that kind of challenge? Yeah, look, I, I, um, 
I haven't seen that evidence. I'm a bit of a statistical person. Let's just take a local example down the road in Shepparton. There's 350 people on a basics card, 200 plus asked to go on it and have stayed on it. So they've volunteered for it. So I'd, I'd back the, the judgment of the individual myself over, over say, a uh, theoretical view. Um, but also to say, I don't think Centrelink is that great at creating employment. Last time I checked, they're great at creating welfare. <laughs> and, a, a, and a Centrelink driven card, well, you know, it's gonna have issues. It's gonna have big issues. It's, it's gonna be soft, touchy feeling. It's gonna do everything for you because you're just, you know, unemployed. You can't do much for yourself. Well, no, that's rubbish. You know, they take 50,000 calls a week. That costs them a fortune. It'd be easier to get someone who wants to check their bank balance on the basics card just to buy them a phone. You check it, baby. Why? Why should we check? No, we, we're flat out taking these calls and checking your bank balance and getting back to you. Well, one thing I know for sure about Indigenous people, particularly the youth, they're more savvy technically than I will ever be. And then for most of my kids, they can hop on a computer or telephone and quickly work these things out. So I don't see a Centrelink driven card as being hugely effective to what it could be. It's better than nothing, much better than nothing. But a bank debit card, well, those, those blokes aren't in charity. They, they want to make a quid. They have to have everything very efficient. So they'll have bank receipts. They'll have accounts you can look up on the email. You'll have the ability to manage yourself in a heartbeat. And that puts people on the road into the financial system, not into the welfare system. And that's where I'd like to see everyone on welfare, mm -hmm. into the financial system. Now, some have said that the, if even those who haven't taken the kind of human rights criticism, that there's a lot about the approach that's paternalistic. Uh, in your report, you also have as a major theme actually empowering remote communities uh, to end the disparity themselves. There's sort of elements of the top down and the bottom up. How do we get those two, how have you thought through the challenge of getting the two working well together? Um, well, look, it's very easy to say it's paternal. Um, you know, I've had uh, a grandfather and a great grandfather s say to me, I am bloody paternal. I want to look after my children, my grandchildren, thank you. Um, I kind of get the sentiment. Um, we don't try and do that. What we try and do is remove all the impediments to employment. So once someone's employed, they're standing on their own two feet, they are no longer vulnerable. So we're just out to remove those impediments. And yes, I am certain that an average decision made locally is going to be much better than a good decision, inverted commas, made from Canberra or Melbourne, Perth or Sydney. Empower people who are just normal, respectable citizens, have 50% of that group, that leadership group, women. And I've got nothing against us blokes. It's just that, you know, we tend to look at our careers and six inches away and maybe a little further, but women tend to look over the horizon. They're very concerned about their kids and their grandkids. So in all developing communities, I've seen women stepping out all the time. So have at least 50% women and have them lead their communities and have them decide all the fundamental decisions and they'll get it right. And you know, I'm not saying here's an open checkbook, right? We do this as also at FMG. We, we empower our people hugely. It's the only reason why we've been able to cut BHP and Rio Tinto's lunch so successfully is by empowering our people. But we don't do it naively. We run spot checks all the time for honesty and competence. And if you're not competent, well, that's no crime. You provide the training and we get people competent quickly. If you're dishonest, we don't sack you and make you someone else's problem, we prosecute you for the full extent of the law. So people know at Fortescue they're going to be seriously empowered. But if they try and race off with a checkbook, they will be fully prosecuted. And I've said this to every community, are you happy operating under that? And there's no community who hasn't stepped up and straight away and said, yes, you're asking us to be responsible. We've been asking that for decades. Sure to cross checks because it's not our money if it's welfare or it's services or this or that. Make sure we're competent, make sure we're honest, just like you do in your company. No difference. One of the 
features of your report is its comprehensiveness, but you've been very clear with government that you want them to implement the whole package, that there's no cherry picking uh, here. Why have you been so strong with government about that no cherry picking? Look, it came from when um, the Prime Minister asked me if I'd do this report into Indigenous training and employment. Um, and then the first meeting with him once he is elected, he said, and I want you to include welfare. To me, that was a real bait and switch. It was, um, so he's my prime minister, but I had to think about refusing that request. Um, and I, I was, I, the contemplation came from the fact that the disparities caused by a whole range of interconnected issues from prenatal, where we're not providing enough very basic education support to women who are pregnant, very young pregnant or normal, just how to live a normal healthy life to give your kid a solid crack at making sure that there's no disparity from the womb onwards. You know, all of these things are completely interrelated. When I asked Melbourne University to step up and be a model employer, like I've asked the Commonwealth Government, when the Commonwealth Government said, we can't possibly employ 4% or issue 4% in, of our total procurement of $39 billion for us, just so naive. So you simplify things. You know, $39 billion, Andrew, we give 4% to Indigenous pe people. That's like $1.5 billion. What are you smoking? I've said, well, mate, I'm not the Commonwealth. I'm one company, proudly in it, but just one company. We've issued $1.6 billion to Indigenous companies, so you just aren't trying. But admittedly, in our companies, we have training services. We teach people what will be valuable to them to turn a quid. Now, if you suddenly drop the, the uh, specificity of the employment services recommendation and say, so, oh, look, you don't really need to employ and you don't really need to train specifically, but we still want Melbourne Uni to employ 4%, well, then you've created a rip in the logic. And that's why it has to be interrelated. Everything depends on everything else. But if we do this, we'll get rid of the disparity. There's no expert who I've spoken to who's, who's looked at the 27 recommendations and been put the question by me, will this end the disparity? There's no expert who I've spoken to who says, yes, that will end the disparity. The kind of question aspect that inevitably flows to, and as, as someone who's done government reviews, there's always a danger that recommendations are accepted, but does, is their implementation follow through? Is there the right kind of levels of accountability? And you've had some things to say about that. What's fresh in, your, in, the, in the approach you've taken to implementation that will actually make sure that if these recommendations, if the cabinet, if Alan kind of embrace this, that we'll actually see this carried through, that, that's new here? Well, I think the University of Melbourne's got a bit to answer for here. Um, I, I sought out who I believe to be a foremost Indigenous academic to mix with my thinking, which is just really practical, and make sure that the recommendations, when they went through, weren't hindered by naivety or lack of knowledge, um, lack of understanding of the sophistication in this area. And Marcia has guided me. We've had some really great blues. It's been fabulous fun. Um, I call it counselling. Um, uh, and um, and uh, it, it's, been, it's been a fantastic journey. But as a result, we've answered the Prime Minister's call to me, which is to say, please do not give me anything I can't implement. You're a practical person, Andrew. Ensure Every recommendation, every policy is totally implementable. And between Marcy and I and Alan, who's done a fantastic job, and a whole range of other people who will never be sung and never be rewarded, we've come up with 27 policies, each of which are completely implementable. Now, I think this government really has the ticker for it. We really need to, despite whatever our politics are. And I've just, you know, before the meeting with the FPOS and bank people, I came from a meeting with the shadow cabinet, just to ensure they were all over it and they understood it completely because we've got to be bipartisan in this. And if, if the country goes bipartisan, we'll implement solutions and we'll hold our government to account to implement the recommendations and end the disparity. 
Terrific. Well, we've got a little time for questions from the audience, so um, might turn it over to uh, see who's got uh, uh, questions out there. Thank you, Rufus. A field. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much for reporting to the last. I was particularly attracted to the very first recommendation, uh, which focuses on conception to the three years of age, which is the whole area I've, I've worked in. But my, my question is really, uh, so the recommendation says that all governments prioritise investment in early childhood. So my, my question is, how do we get them to use the evidence base for the things that we know that works? And I'm thinking in particular about the early learning programs from naught to three. Your report talks about from three-year-olds, but so much learning happens in that first three years. I don't need to go into the detail, but it's, it's ensuring that not only they address naught to three, but they're using an evidence base. Yes, so naught to three is, as you know better than anyone, is where a human being learns most. Um, and uh, that's, that's typified, in, as you know, in brain growth. You know, the, we, we tend to spend a fortune on the brain growth of five or eight percent. If this was an investment, you'd be lousy, right? Um, between three years of age and 19, where the brain reaches its maximum size. But the brain grows three or four hundred percent. If this was an investment, that's where I'd be putting my money. Three or four hundred percent in three years, that sounds pretty cool. Well, we don't do that as government. And um, there, there is bodies of evidence which demonstrate that you can take practices which have worked and multiply it out across the nation. And they're not very complex, they're not complex at all, they're, qu they're, they're simple. And there's models around which from three onwards can beat the NAPLAN average despite the worst vulnerability in your society. Schools can beat the NAPLAN average comfortably, not just at the end of primary school, but going into primary school because of proper attention to zero to three. So I'm fixated on this because it will prevent the disparity from continuing, but we have to also resolve it as it's here now. So we've got to keep that balance. But you've just pictured my passion. Thank you. Other questions? Sam. There's a lady over here. Ah, and I'll come to you next. Sam Rosevere, um, Deputy Secretary Policy in the Victorian Department of State Development. I'm just wondering about what you'd advise state governments that they need to step up and do. Okay, so that's a really important point. Much more important than bilateral support in the, at the Commonwealth level is bilateral support between state and Commonwealth. The real gap as it exists is between Commonwealth and state. and um, and. Uh, we've tried to articulate a resolution to that gap through suggesting an agreement between two governments. Now, as you'd know, because we're here in the law faculty, I think that you can't make government to government agreements enforceable, but at least you can hold them to account publicly. Um, and I would ask that, um, that uh, states open themselves up to complete transparency and accountability, agreeing to become part of and cooperating enthusiastically with a creating parity website where the money you're spending and the programs which you're endorsing get completely measured for outcomes on almost a daily basis. And, uh, and so that's first. Second is where policies are required, such as linking family benefits payments to school attendance. Well, that needs absolute state to federal cooperation because states have the schools, Commonwealths have Centrelink and the money. To match the two, the instant some politician or bureaucrat starts to muddy the waters and say, well, I'll do this if you increase my funding or you do this, you do that, or you don't throw out the this or that, then what they're really doing in that statement, in that smart ass little edge of negotiation, is saying, removing the disparity is not important to me. Indigenous people are just a tool in my toolbox to get something else. So I'd like the states to remember that. Say, actually, we're here to end the disparity. If we stand in the, in, in the, in the road of any of the recommendations or anything 
which is not in the review, and there's a series of great initiatives which are, of course, not in the review. Stand in the road of the implementation because you want to nego negotiate another outcome. You're literally negotiating with the lives of Aboriginal people. And so I'd, I'd ask that reality to dawn on every meeting place between state and federal. And that, Alan Tudge, is why I want you to come to Adelaide tomorrow. <laughs> question here. Yeah. Jane Reynolds Foundation, 1901. If I can draw you back to a few statements you've made and equate them to the same thing. You're setting this country up to fail. Let's get rid of gambling and don't give me anything I can't implement. And God forbid I raise bureaucrats and I would add politicians and the concept of risk. Now, if I can bring all those back to one word and I'm waiting for a groan from the audience, federation. Um, don't set us up to fail. Eight out of 44 attempts and the gentleman over there really doesn't want to hear it. Let's get rid of gambling. Now, how do we get rid of gambling when one of the few revenue growth areas for state governments is in the area of gambling? We have a system that sets a perverse incentive structure in that regard. And the comment from the Prime Minister, don't give me anything I can't implement, I'll actually take you back to words from your own report saying, urgent cooperation is needed between the Commonwealth and the states, and we've just heard your response to Sam. Federation, 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 politicians, bureaucrats and risk. How do we get it done? And is it actually time to incentivise pe people of Australia and markets to try and do something about that too? Yeah, look, I think the review is all about incentivising markets and encouraging markets. By, by gambling, I'm not talking about all gambling per se. I might have private views on that, but I haven't been asked to address them. The gambling I'm talking about is the problem gambling. I did contact the people you'd expect me to contact um, when I said I, I would like to recommend a card which will prohibit gambling amongst vulnerable Australians. And the response was, they are the people who cause all the problems in our casinos or in our places of whatever. Um, and we're very happy to encourage that policy. So I didn't get resistance from those who make their uh, um, livelihood out of gambling because they are obviously looking for responsible gambling and that's not what I'm talking about. And time for one last, uh, one last question. Looks like we have one left. Thank you very much. My name's Gillian Rivers. I'm a sociologist. Um, I'm wanting to ask a couple of questions. Um, they're from a practical level. I've worked in the Northern Territory in 2007 and I was the operational manager for unemployment in that area, but I've got a health background. Um, I'm very appreciative of the work that you've done, uh, especially to Marcia Langton, who, as always, uh, steps forward and gives so much of her time to her people and the communities around. Um, when I was up there, I had a lot of Indigenous staff most of them were 10 times smarter than all the whiteys, and that just went without saying. If they got there, they were better than all of us. So uh, on the employment area, there were just so many things we could do. We were tied by the bureaucrats, left, right and centre. You couldn't move. Um, so I... I Certainly the opportunities are there, especially with the kids and the vet programs. They were very successful. Enterprise, really successful. My major areas of concern come down to the issue of family and uh, community violence. And that sort of links in with Fiona Stanley's work there. Um, but even the truancy that you're talking about um, there were a lot of grandmas that kept their kids out of school on purpose and they kept them out on purpose because the school grounds weren't safe. Um, a lot of the kids were being sexually abused by the older children and you can put all the truancy officers that you want in there but there's no police presence 
in most of the remote Indigenous communities and there's no safety with within the actual school or out in the communities. And most of those grandmas are bearing that burden of having to negotiate all those things. So unless you have a safety perspective that starts in the communities and goes all the way through, it's an impediment to learning, to going into school, to going into employment because those issues of violence within the family and community still exist all the way around. Were you satisfied that the teachers of, that, of those schools had sufficient experience to handle those situations? Um, I lived in Arnhem Land for uh, a month uh, before I went into that role and the local teacher was in the house next door to us. There were four of us in the other house. And she was 27 years of age and she lived um, behind 17 foot high razor wire fence. And even we had difficulties in getting in there to use the washing machine because she was terrified out of her brain. Um, there were four women in this house and the only one that could really walk around easily was Shelley Morris, who was a musician that had come down to teach the kids. So no, the teachers didn't have experience. Most of the communities we went into, they were taking um, really high performing kids and that's what they were, kids. And when they were confronted with the reality, they were just really traumatised. I think we need to send our, our best teachers out to remote communities as opposed to the current system where young teachers often fresh out of school are sent out there to you know, do their time, get the experience. It's just that that is really all wrong. We need to send our best teachers out, be prepared to incentivise them, your word, madam, and encourage them and reward them. In Western Australia, there's a system that if a teaching, a ex very experienced teaching couple goes out um, to a remote community and stays there for seven years, they've got enough capital accumulated to come back into an urban area and buy their own home. So we make a point very much of sending out the most experienced teachers. There should not be any reason why anywhere in Australia you need to live behind barbed wire, except for the fact that in many of these communities, uh, you get a very cash rich environment, which are then targeted by the drug lords um, and the alcohol peddlers and anyone on crystal meth or anyone on some of these harder drugs, which are targeted into communities such as the one you lived in for a month, they become violent communities. And I wouldn't blame the people, I'd blame a system which allows it, a soft headed system, which allows those drug lords to stay and work and get rich instead of your children. And I want to reverse that. I want to see the drug dealers out of work and the kids into work. And what about the tribal issues? The tribal issues is a complete another subject which I'd love to discuss, but um, fortunately my host is called time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Andrew, can I, uh, before we hand over to uh, Professor Anderson to close this evening, can I thank you for the uh, richness, the depth of insight, the frankness that you've uh, shared with us tonight and the willingness to engage uh, with us all on this critical topic for our national future. So, Andrew, thank you very thank much. You.